Hello, and welcome to this video on Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, also known as QAM. In this video, we'll be looking at how we can use Quadrature Amplitude Modulation to send multiple bits of data at the same time. So to first understand what Quadrature Amplitude Modulation is, we must first look at Amplitude Modulation. If you've seen my previous video, then you will have seen this animation. On the top, it shows a carrier wave oscillating at a certain frequency. Below this carrier wave is a modulation waveform, which when multiplied together gives us our signal, which is the middle plot. We can see that when the data is zero, the signal out is zero, and when the data is one, the signal out is the carrier wave oscillation, which gives us discrete chunks of zeros and ones. On the receiving end, we see that we get a signal, which we then can do something called product demodulation. Product demodulation is when we multiply the signal by a sinusoidal waveform, the same frequency as the original carrier wave. Once we filter out the high frequency components, what we're left with is something that resembles our original modulation waveform very closely. In the mathematics of amplitude modulation, goes like this. We have our wave, which is the modulation waveform A of T, multiplied by some sinusoidal or cosinusoidal wave with a frequency F. This is known as our modulated carrier. The product T modulation step is when we multiply this wave by a cosine or sine of the same frequency. This then gives us a signal that is proportional to the summation of the modulation waveform and a high frequency component oscillating at twice the original carrier frequency. This is known as the demodulated carrier. We can then apply some filtering to the high frequency components, which should then leave us with a signal that's roughly equal to the original modulation waveform A of T. And so how do we add quadrature components to our amplitude modulation? But what does quadrature mean? Quadrature very simply means two signals which are out of phase by plus or minus 90 degrees, or plus or minus pi over 2. So for example, sine and sine of x plus or minus pi over 2 are two quadrature waves. Likewise, cosine and cosine plus or minus pi by 2 is also a quadrature signal. And so naturally, sine and cosine are two signals that are in quadrature. And this can be shown on a graph like this. You can see how the waves are the same. They are 90 degrees out of phase with each other. And so what happens if we take an amplitude modulated signal, which here we'll call I of T, which consists of a modulation waveform AI of T, multiplied by the cosine of 2 pi f of t, where f is our carrier frequency. And what happens if I take another modulated waveform here, q of t, with a different modulation waveform, a of q, but now multiplied by sine of 2 pi f of t? If we then add those two signals together, we get something very simple, which is just the addition of the two. Now the trick with these quadrature signals is to realize that if we multiply the summation of the two quadrature signals by cosine 2 pi f of t, what we end up with is the expression here. You'll notice that we have a constant expression a i of t, which was the original modulation waveform of the cosine component i of t, multiplied by some high frequency oscillations at twice the original carrier frequency. Likewise, if we multiply the same i plus q of t by sine of 2 pi f of t, what we end up with is a constant a q of t, which was our original modulation waveform for the sine component, q of t, with some more high frequency oscillations. And so it stands to reason that filtering those signals should now lead us to be able to recover our original modulation waveforms a of i and a of q. So even though we start off with two separate signals, cosine and sine, multiplied them independently with some modulation waveforms, upon doing coherent demodulation in which we multiply one by cosine and one by sine, 
we can recover our original signals. And so the process for quadrature amplitude modulation goes something like this. We start off with our two modulated carrier waves, and then we add them together. We can then send this out. Once our signal is sent out and received, we can take that signal and coherently demodulate it, in which we can multiply it by cosine of 2 pi f of t and sine of 2 pi f of t. In each case, we recover the amplitude modulation signal applied to each of the original carrier waves. What's important to note here is that the demodulation is coherent. So we must multiply by cosine and sine for the original carrier wave. Now this is very important, is that then we need to know the exact phase of the original carrier wave, otherwise we will not be able to extract our original AI and AQT signals. The last step is to filter the signals, which to give us a good approximation to the original modulation waveforms. And so just to look at the differences between amplitude modulation and quadrature amplitude modulation. For amplitude modulation, we only have one carry wave, and for quadrature amplitude modulation, we have two. The carrier phases must be in quadrature for the quadrature amplitude modulation, and the demodulation must be coherent for the quadrature amplitude modulation. There is no such restriction on not regular amplitude modulation for coherent demodulation. And so next let's talk about constellation diagrams. So for amplitude modulation, you can imagine the amplitude of the carrier wave is modulated by the modulation signal. So for a simple binary 0 and 1, you can imagine we have the possible amplitude of the modulation waveform can be either 0 or 1, representing 0 or 1. And so for the modulation frequency, which is how often we switch our bits of 0 and 1, we are sending one bit per symbol. Symbol here means per modulation time period. Instead, you could define multiple amplitude levels. So for example, you could not just choose 0 and 1 corresponding to min and max amplitude. You could choose intermediate values, in which case, when the receiver sees these intermediate values of amplitude, it could assign them different symbols. So for example, in this case, we would have four distinct states, so we can call this two bits per symbol. So for every change in modulation, we convey two unique bits. Now for QAM, this is very similar, but rather than being a one-dimensional amplitude modulation, we have a two-dimensional amplitude modulation. So for example, if we look at a 4QAM, which is a way of expressing the total number of states available, we have a constellation diagram like this. We can see that for the I of T carrier, which remember was the carrier in our case that was multiplied by cosine, we can see that we have two possible amplitudes. Here, the amplitudes are around minus 0.75 and 0.75. Likewise, the Q amplitude signal which was the one multiplied by sine, also has two amplitude states, which are also approximately 0.75 and 0.75. Now, the advantages of QAM is that we can pack more of these states into our constellation diagram. So rather than just having two bits per symbol, we could move to some higher level QAM, such as 16 QAM. In this case, it's possible to fit four bits per symbol. So you can see here, we have a total 16 states available. So for the I of T channel, we can see we have four states around minus 0.75, minus 0.25, 0.25, and 0.75. Likewise for the Q T channel, we also have those available states. So by choosing unique combinations of the amplitude of I of T and Q of T, we can select different symbols, which will give us four bits per symbol. Lastly, we can fit even more of these onto our constellation diagram by going to higher levels of QAM, such as 256, in which case we have a total of 16 amplitude states, both the I and Q of T channels. For this particular system, we would be sending 8 bits per symbol. And so taking a closer look, you can clearly see here how the different amplitudes of I and T and Q of T correspond to different bit values. And likewise, for the 256 quam, we can see 8 bits per symbol.
Now let's have a look how we would send this information. So imagine you have a bit string like this. That represents some data you wish to send. And then for four different types of modulation, so simple amplitude modulation, a 4QAM, 16QAM and 256QAM. At some period of time, we'll be switching our state depending on the data to send, which will be known as our modulation period. And so for simple amplitude modulation, we simply have to look whether the bit is 0 or 1, and then change the amplitude accordingly. For a 4QAM, what we have is four possible states, because we have two bits per symbol. Depending on the state, we'll change the values of i of t and q of t. Likewise, for 16QAM, we have more symbols which we can send, and so the amplitude states of both i and t of q of t will be different. And the same for 256QAM, this time we have 8 bits per symbol. And you'll notice that within the same period of time, we can send more information with the higher levels of QAM. So this entire bit string here can be sent in just three of our modulation periods using a 256 QAM, but requires six modulation periods using a 16 QAM, 12 using a 4 QAM, and 24 using amplitude modulation. So let's look at a more interesting example. So what I have here is an animation showing a 4 QAM system. On the top left, we have the two independent carrier waves, which have been modulated. So these are our modulated carrier waves, our I of T and our Q of T signals, which have been multiplied by cosine and sine respectively. The next graph on the left is the summation of these two. You can see it just looks like quite a random assortment of sine and cosine. Two plots below that are the interesting part. So here is where we perform the coherent demodulation. On the left, we multiply by cosine. On the right, we multiply by sine. And then after just a simple filter operation to filter out the frequencies at twice the carrier frequency, we can see that we end up recovering a signal at the bottom. These signals are the I and Q modulation amplitudes which you can see on the right, we are tracking. So you see here, we're currently looking at the bit 01, which has now switched to 00. 00, zero, zero is achieved with an IT amplitude of minus 0.75 and a QT amplitude of minus 0.75, which you could just see. We now switch over to another bit, which you can see now 10. And you can see we can keep going like this. So for every unique bit symbol, we see that we're basically extracting the amplitudes of the I channel and the Q channel independently. So for the bit 1, 1, I must be 0.75 and Q must be 0.75, which you see here. Now I has remained at 0.75, but Q has changed to minus 0.75, which we can clearly see on the left. And so every time we change our state, which is around every seven seconds, we can see that the bits that we send have changed. And so this is just a still from the previous animation. So you can clearly see here that our bit of 0, 01 is an I amplitude of 0 0.75 and a Q amplitude of minus 0 0.75, which is clearly represented on the filtered signals on the bottom left. So we've successfully extracted the information, which you can see in the second graph, was indeed 0, 01. So let's have a look at some higher level QAM. So for a 16 QAM, we have the following. So instead of sending just two bits per symbol, we're now sending four at a time. This gives us more unique amplitude states which we can send. So you can see that on the receiver on the bottom left, we're now receiving up to four possible levels of amplitude for both the I channel and the Q channel. These four levels can then correspond together to one of the bits on the constellation diagram. 
We're modulating at the same 7 second period which we were before. Now we're sending 4 bits at a time instead of 2. And so this data will be sent twice as quick as before. And so before where it took around 130 seconds, this should be done in around 65 seconds. So we should be coming up to one of our last bits now. And we can see we're done. So the last bit to send was 0111, which is an I amplitude of 0.75 and a Q amplitude of minus 0.25, which we can clearly see on the bottom left. Now let's take a look at an even higher level of QAM, 64 QAM. So here, we're sending 6 bits at a time. So you can see the first bit comes in, that corresponds to an I and a Q amplitude, which we can see that we on the bottom left where we filtered out our coherently demodulated signal, we can indeed recover those amplitudes and extract those bits. And now because we're sending 6 bits per symbol, instead of 4 bits per symbol, we should finish sending all of our data quicker than we did when we were sending 4 bits per symbol. So previously it took around 63 seconds to send all our data when sending 4 bits per symbol. With the 64 QAM, we send all our data in just 42 seconds. So it's the same modulation frequency, the same modulation period, but we're sending more information per modulation using many more levels of amplitude on the I and Q channel. And it's important to know here, if we had a lot of noise in our signal, the little red X that follows around the filtered amplitude states would not be so well defined. They would tend to jiggle about on their spot. And depending on how much they jiggle on the spot, will determine how close we can put our values in the constellation diagram. If the values are too close, then we could misinterpret some simply because of random noise. And so just to still from the previous 64 gram, we can see that our original signal was 010100, which is an I amplitude of around 0.1 and a Q amplitude of around minus 0.3, which you can see is being picked up by the filtered signals on the bottom left. So we can really see how by choosing more bits to send per symbol, which results in more amplitude levels for both the I and Q channel, we can send more bits during the same modulation period, meaning we can send more bits in the same period of time. So where a simple amplitude modulation would require us to send our zeros and ones faster, which would require us to have a higher frequency carrier wave in order to handle the higher frequency modulation wave, WAM does something different by changing the number of amplitude levels of two quadrature signals in order to send more data so has clear advantages in terms of the ability to send data on lower frequency carrier waves. And so let's just talk about filtering. Let's say we have a quadrature amplitude modulated signal consisting of two independent waves. So here we have our I channel and our Q channel, and here we're modulating at 7 hertz. Let's say we have another independently modulated QAM signal. So here, an I2 and a Q2 signal, independently modulated by an A2 and a B2, but this time at 14 hertz. And finally, we have a third independently modulated quadrature amplitude modulated signal, I3, which has a carry frequency of 21 hertz. So the Fourier transform for these three signals is given as follows. So you can see here, that the modulation signals A and B is information in the frequency space located around the carrier frequencies of 7, 14 and 21. And we can see there is some overlap between the two. So where are the information for the A and B signals on the 7 hertz in red? You can see how that overlaps with some of the A and B signal on the 14 hertz in blue and likewise for green. But just like amplitude modulation, if you saw my last video, you would have seen that it was no problem to use different carrier frequencies, modulate these independently because our demodulation process always successfully extracted the amplitude modulated signal. Well, the same goes for QAM. So let's have a look. If we add all these signals together, 
we end up with our signal out. Now, I won't write the math for this because it's a very long equation. But imagine we take our total signal out and we multiply it by cosine and sine, both at 7 hertz. Cosine and sine, both at 14 hertz. And cosine and sine at 21 hertz. We can then use the same low pass filter and all of this data. And yet what we find is that we're able to extract the individual modulation signals that were applied to the signals before. Independent of their carrier frequency. So we can still recover both the cosine and sine components A and B for each of the individual frequency components that we sent out. Let's take a further look at this and hopefully make it more clear. So on the left we have our unfiltered signals, on the right we have our filtered signals. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply everything on here by cosine of 2 pi f of t and we'll be changing our frequency. So on the left here you can see that our unfiltered signals multiplied by cosine result in some crazy looking signals. Likewise the total signal in white also starts to look crazy. But the main thing to watch for is the Fourier transform on the bottom. You see that as we increase the frequency of the cosine that we multiply our signals with, we start to separate out our frequency components in the Fourier space. And so when we approach 7 Hz, what you'll see is that the signal in red is now centered around 0 Hz. This means that we can extract our original information, so our original modulation wave, from this signal by the simple use of filtering. So let's take a look again. Now watch the blue curve on the bottom left, which is our Fourier transform for the 14 Hz signal. As we times this by cosine of 14 Hz, you'll see that the signal, filter signal on the right in white, when it hits 14 Hz, will be a recovered modulation wave. There. And then this can continue all the way up to 21 Hz, in which we'll extract the modulation wave which was applied to our green 21 hertz signal. Perhaps if we look here you'll see more clearly that when we multiply our curves by cosine wave at 7 hertz our frequency spectrum on the bottom has shifted everything that is not at 7 hertz to higher frequencies and the 7 hertz has been shifted towards 0 hertz. And so our original modulation signal is now centered around 0 hertz. And so a simple filter, which is shown on the right, can then extract a signal, which is predominantly composed of our original modulated signal that was applied to the 7 hertz carrier. This filtered signal in white above is then the original signal that was sent out, which you can see in red on the top right. And so we get a very good way in which we can extract the signal, even though we combined two different quadrature waves at the same frequency, and then three of those together at different frequencies. It's still possible to use quadrature amplitude modulation on each of these subcarriers. We can do the same for the 14 hertz, in which case we recover the blue curve. So on the top right, you can see the blue modulation signal, which matches the white signal on the right. And likewise, for the 21 hertz, we recover the green signal on the top right and just blow it in white. So this is really useful because you can see that we can have independently modulated carrier waves which increase the amount of bits we can send per modulation time. So that can keep our modulation frequency low. So we can send out a lot of information using the same modulation frequency. And then if we want to further increase the amount of data we send out, we don't necessarily have to add more states to our QAM. Instead, we can choose a different carrier frequency which is separated by an appropriate amount and then modulate that using a QAM signal. So this is used in things like cable television and terrestrial television in which each channel is on a different frequency and on each of those frequencies there is an independent wham modulated signal so when you change channel you're effectively tuning in to that particular frequency on your demodulator which is the same here as choosing whether you want to see the red blue or green data this data is then the data required to reconstruct the image and audio for your viewing pleasure And so thanks for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. Please do leave a like or dislike, depending on your opinion on the video. And if you want to see more videos like this, consider hitting the subscribe button.